In medicine, we talk about comorbidities. Oh, cholesterol is a problem. Blood pressure is a problem. Blood sugar is a problem. They're all separate. We have to treat them all separately with different drugs. No, <laughs> they're, they're all connected by underlying root mechanisms that have to do with glucose and insulin and our metabolic health. Insulin drives inappropriate cell proliferation and growth. So we have cheap food, we have doctors who are not treating root causes, and we have monumental challenges that our bodies are facing. And therefore, it is up to us as individuals to get on top of this. We are on a mission to inspire, heal, and bring the world closer together. Welcome to Commune. My name is Jeff Krasnow. Today on the show, we explore the role that the molecule glucose plays in your metabolic health. You will hear from three experts on blood sugar and metabolism, doctors Mark Hyman, Casey Means, and Robert Lustig. Before we dive in, I want to share a little bit about my own personal metabolic journey, because like 88% of all Americans, I was, until recently, metabolically dysfunctional. I was trudging through life, generally convinced of my good health, exercising regularly, and running a wellness company. Yet deep down, I sensed there was something off kilter. Despite my best efforts, I found myself chronically fatigued, brain fogged, and carrying excess weight around my middle. It was only when I began using a continuous glucose monitor that the truth was revealed. So a continuous glucose monitor or CGM is a little sensor that is self-applied to my triceps and connects to an app. It tracks my blood sugar levels throughout the day, providing me with a transparent sort of dashboard into my own personal vehicle. And to my surprise, I discovered I was teetering on the edge of pre-diabetes. My fasting glucose levels were elevated and after meals or postprandially, my blood sugar would skyrocket to alarming heights. Now, I am not alone. 50% of all Americans are diabetic or pre-diabetic and 90% of pre-diabetics are, like me, unaware of their condition. So obviously this was a wake up call, a moment of realization that I needed to make a change in my life. So I became my own N of one experiment, tinkering with various protocols while monitoring my CGM. Uh, through combining a plant focused ketogenic diet, a 16, eight intermittent fasting protocol and deliberate cold hydrotherapy, I was able to reverse my insulin resistance and lower my fasting glucose levels to an optimal level in only about three months. I got rid of my brain fog, increased my energy levels, started sleeping better, and as a happy byproduct of upgrading my metabolism, I lost 45 pounds and I've largely kept it off. So I share this information with you because if I did it, you can do it too. Now, today's episode is all about metabolic health, its mechanisms and the downstream impacts that occur to chronically elevated blood sugar levels. Now, much of the metabolic dysfunction we see in Western culture can be attributed to modern lifestyle practices and how those habits clash with the million year engineering exercise that is our biological evolution. Now, our first guest is the esteemed Dr. Mark Hyman, a physician and internationally recognized leader in the field of functional medicine. He talks with us about the prevalence of insulin resistance, how you can prevent and reverse this condition through diet and through lifestyle choices. So without further delay, here's Mark. So we can get into some of those things down 
in the rabbit hole of DNA methylation or mitochondrial dysfunction, et cetera. Yeah. But I think one thing, I, one thread I'd like to pull on is a statistic that you referenced um, just there around metabolic syndrome or metabolic dysfunction. I think you said 88% yeah. yeah. of Americans are experiencing yeah. some form of degraded metal, metabolic health. What does that mean? What does that mean? Yeah. So, so you know, essentially what it means is we're all in somehow in the spectrum of diabetes and prediabetes. Yeah. So poor metabolic health is defined as high blood sugar, abnormal cholesterol, or high blood pressure. And in medicine, we talk about comorbidities. Oh, cholesterol is a problem. Blood pressure is a problem. Blood sugar is a problem. They're all separate. We have to treat them all separately with different drugs. No, <laughs> they're, they're all connected by underlying root mechanisms that have to do with glucose and insulin and our metabolic health. So it's those, all those problems stem from having something we call insulin resistance or what you mentioned called metabolic syndrome it used to be called syndrome X, but essentially it's where we have dysregulated blood sugar mm -hmm. because we're eating foods that we're not adapted to eat. So genetically, some of us are the yellow canaries, like Native Americans, African Americans, Latinos, East Asians, Samoans, Pacific Islanders, all are massively carbohydrate intolerant. They look at a bagel and they gain weight, right? Whereas some of us, you know, maybe are more insulin sensitive genetically. So if I have a can of Coke, my insulin goes like this. Uh, maybe if you're a Pima Indian, it goes like this. Yeah. Well, the consequences of the same food causing different profound responses leads to these accelerated uh, pathologies we see. For example, in the Native Americans, you know, they're, 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 um, uh, 30, 30, by the age of 30, 80% have type 2 diabetes. Their life expectancy is 46. You know, children are getting type 2 diabetes at 2 and 3 years old because they're feeding their kids soda. <laughs> so so, we, yeah. ha so we, 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 you know, we used to call it adult onset diabetes. We can't call it that anymore. Now we have to call it type 2 instead of juvenile and adult onset diabetes. Yeah, give me an idea of the scale of pre-diabetes, for example, at this juncture. I mean, right, what's 88%? Yeah. So 75% so of people are overweight, 40, up over, up, moving over 40% are obese. And even skinny people can have this. So yeah. there's a phenomenon called metabolically obese normal weight or skinny fat or tofi thin on the outside, fat on the inside. So essentially you have this accumulation of visceral fat, organ fat, that may not make you, in terms of your BMI, your body mass index, overweight technically, but you're over fat and under lean. And so if you have not enough muscle, too much fat, you end up with this phenomena of prediabetes. But the problem with calling it prediabetes implies that it, in and of itself, it's not a problem until you get diabetes. But it's a misnomer because prediabetes itself will cause heart attacks, strokes, cancers, Alzheimer's, and prediabetes causes predementia. It's not, there's no pre to it. It's actually deadly in and of itself. Yeah, you're already on the spectrum. Yeah, and, and it's a spectrum, yeah. right? So there's, there's a spectrum from just mild blood sugar imbalances all the way to full-blown type 2 diabetes. Right. So let's pull the thread on that mechanism, you know, because oftentimes we hear like, okay, well, diabetes is a precursor for coronary artery, coronary yeah, artery yeah, disease yeah. or something. So I'll just set you up and then you can kind of explain to us like what happens when there is, when you get hyperglycemic, chronic, yeah, yeah. chronic hyperglycemia. Yeah. So we eat carbs. A lot of us don't eat particularly well. We eat processed foods or refined sugars, or refined grains, et cetera, that goes into our GI tract. Our stomach does its best to break it down with enzymes and acids and stuff. It enters our small intestine as <clears throat> chyme or some sort of slurpy substance or whatever, yeah, yeah. and it gets absorbed into our bloodstream from there as glucose and insulin, that's a little peptide hormone that produced in the pancreas, picks it up and it's supposed to usher it to our cells uh, where there are these little mitochondria, our energy production factories that are supposed to then create ATP mm -hmm. out mm -hmm. of glucose. That's great when that's all happening at its optimal level, but that's not what's happening with people with metabolic syndrome. So what's going on in that yeah. supply chain? Well, well, I'm going to just, you know, before I dive into that, I just, want, I just want to frame this a little bit because science is advancing so fast and most doctors and media and and certainly the government and the policymakers do not have a clue what's happening here. There, there are 
now defined a number of key longevity switches in the body mm. that are regulated by nutrients and it's a nutrient sensing system. So we have exquisite systems in our body to detect levels of amino acids and fatty acids and sugars that then turn on or off different mechanisms that either help us build new tissue, do things we have to do, more protein, protein synthesis, or to repair, break down and clean up all the things that need to be cleaned up. And so these nutrient sensing pathways regulate longevity and you need to turn them on and off in the right balance in the right way, kind of like Goldilocks, so you can actually extend your life and optimize your health. The problem is we are always in the on position. We never give our body a pause and rest. So, I mean, from the minute we wake up to the minute we go to bed, we're eating. I mean, the invention of snacking has been the biggest abomination and disaster for human health yeah. because we, we just are constantly flooding our system with nutrients and don't give our body a chance to repair and heal. And the worst form of these nutrients and the things that, that actually affect uh, these pathways called sirtuins, AMPK, and mTOR, which are these longevity switches that regulate aging and health and repair of tissues and rejuvenation and reversal of aging, these are activated in a, in a bad way or suppressed, in, as we talk about, in a bad way when you have too much circulating sugar. <laughs> and, 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 and we are in a flood of sugar. We eat 152 pounds of sugar, 133 pounds of flour per person per year, almost a pound a day per person of a substances that we never ate until about 100 years ago. I mean, the, the, right. the flour mill was an invention of the 1800s. In 19, 1800, we consumed about, you know, maybe 10 pounds of sugar a year. Now we consume about 152 pounds. And our hunter-gatherer ancestors consumed 22 teaspoons a year. Now the average American consumes that every day. That's right? insane. Every day. Yeah. And our biology is, is not adapted to that. So mm -hmm. we have all these mechanisms that adapt us to starvation, scarcity, adversity. And it's great at keeping us alive and healthy when there ain't enough food around. But if we're, you know, living in a food carnival 24-7, uh, all the, the pathways that lead to disease are turned on and all the pathways that are disease reversal pathways are turned off. And so when you consume large amounts of glucose and large amounts of starch and sugar, and people talk about complex, simple carbohydrates, people are still confused about this. I talked to a doctor the other day. He's like, oh, you want to eat complex carbs? I'm like, white bread is a complex carb. It just has to do with the structure of the starch. That's what it means. It's a scientific term. What we really should care about is the glycemic load and the glycemic index of foods. How does it spike your blood sugar? So yeah. white bread, which is a complex carb, spikes your blood sugar more than sugar, which is a simple carb which is worse for you, the bread. Right. <laughs> so you yeah. might as well have your you know, sugar on your sandwich instead of bread. <laughs> and bread. <laughs> no, I'm not saying to do that, but yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So I think, I think we, we, we have to understand that, that we need to eat in a way that does not activate excess insulin. And, mm -hmm. and the truth is, Jeff, that, that most doctors do not understand this. They're looking at way late in the system of failure. So by the time you check your blood sugar and it starts going up, if it's over 87 or 85, you're starting to get in trouble. If it's 100, you're really in trouble. If it's 110, that's bad. If you're 126, it's diabetes. But your, your blood sugar stays highly controlled by high levels of insulin until it can't keep up anymore. Yeah. And so I've seen patients who were severely metabolically deranged, who were very overweight, big giant bellies, abnormal triglycerides, low HDL, all the other biomarkers, but their blood sugar is perfect, perfect. I'm like, how is this possible? And I give them a giant sugar load, like if I call them two Coca-Colas, perfect okay. blood sugar, nothing. What's up? And I check their insulin levels. Now, most doctors never check their insulin level. And her insulin levels were 10, 20 times normal to keep her blood sugar down until it can't compensate anymore. And then the blood sugar starts going up. Right. So you're stressing the pancreas at that juncture, right? Yeah. The, yeah. And so, so, you know, if I were to say like you say, Mark, what is the number one test you would do to check on someone to see really everything about their longevity and aging? It would be insulin. Yeah. And if I had my choice, it would be insulin after giving them two Coca-Colas. 
<laughs> so not fasting insulin. Well, fasting, yes. Yeah. But the first step is the first step is your your two hour insulin or thirty minute insulin goes up. Mm -hmm. Then your fasting insulin goes up. Then your two hour sugar goes up. Then your fasting sugar goes up. Then over time your A one C goes up. So when doctors yeah. are checking things, they're checking things like way, way, way downstream. Late. Yeah. So let's say there's a big bouncer at the door of your cell and it says, you know, uh, no more glucose for energy, you know, sorry, insulin, the club is full, you yep. know? And so then you have hyperglycemia mm -hmm. and yes, yeah, some of that glucose can be stored in the liver as glycogen and can be used for a rainy day, right? 2,500 calories. Not okay. Much. So not much. So what happens to all of the other high concentrated, uh, when your when your blood <clears throat> stream is high concentration. What, what happens is what happens is insulin two things really happen. One is that your your insulin will keep increasing to shove the fuel into your cells. But it doesn't just shove it into any cells. It preferentially shoves it into your fat cells around your belly, your belly fat. We call it mm -hmm. visceral fat. Yeah. So essentially it floods these fat cells with fat free fatty acids and glucose and it just they get nice and big and fat. And then they turn into these monster fat cells that are uh, dangerous. They're like producing all these inflammatory molecules, cytokines, hormones, neurotransmitters. And so you end up seeing that these are basically factories for death and disease. So why is obesity such a huge risk factor for COVID? Right. Because those fat cells in the belly produce a cytokine called interleukin-6 or IL-6. Right. When you get a virus, it's like, it's like you're already pre-inflamed. And the virus activates your immune system, but it's like it just overshoots. And then you get this phenomenon called the cytokine storm we've heard about. Right. And that's what kills people. And so if you, if you don't have a lot of these cytokines floating around you're, you're going to be less likely to get really sick. Yeah, this is so important because, you know, when people are reading the news or watching the news and, you know, they're seeing, oh, well, the mortality uh, around COVID is connected to people with X amount of comorbidities. Well, this is this is yeah. why yeah. you've just you've just basically explained why that happens. Yes. And so uh, we talk about cancer, dementia, heart disease, kidney disease, high blood pressure stroke and obviously diabetes they're all caused same by thing. the same thing they're <laughs> yeah. all caused by insulin resistance they're calling alzheimer's type 3 diabetes cancer is so much higher in people who are overweight or have insulin resistance or diabetes say same with heart disease stroke and everything else so it is the biggest single problem we have and and it's super solvable by modulating our diet and exercising and dealing with those underlying longevity switches and learning how to actually turn the right switches in the right way Metabolic health issues such as high blood sugar, abnormal cholesterol, and high blood pressure are interconnected through underlying root mechanisms involving glucose and insulin. So rather than treating these issues as separate conditions, it's important to recognize the common thread that ties them together. Now, the body has intricate nutrient sensing pathways that detect the levels of different macronutrients such as proteins and fatty acids and carbohydrates and activates or deactivates specific mechanisms accordingly. And when these pathways are properly balanced, they support processes like protein synthesis, tissue repair, and rejuvenation, leading to optimal health and increased lifespan and health span. So however, Excessive nutrient intake, particularly in the form of refined sugars and processed foods, disrupts the balance in these pathways. Now, constantly flooding the body with excessive nutrients, especially sugars, keeps these pathways in a perpetually active state. And this disruption negatively impacts the body's ability to repair and to heal leading to a higher risk of age-related diseases and a compromised state of health. So while food scarcity is a real problem, overnutrition negatively impacts more people globally than hunger. Now, balancing abundance and scarcity 
and growth and repair is key to metabolic well-being and vitality. So next, you'll hear from Dr. Casey Means, a Stanford-trained physician and the chief medical officer of Metabolic Health Company Levels. She shares with us the essential mechanisms of metabolism, as well as the importance of agency in the matter of choosing to be healthy. So without further delay, here's Dr. Casey Means. Maybe you can just set the table by describing what metabolic health is mm. and, and its relationship to blood glucose levels. Yes, I mean, so much great information even there in that question, in that lead up, um, you know, what, what you, one thing you mentioned is just the magnitude of this chronic disease epidemic that we're facing today. And what's so incredible about this epidemic of all these chronic diseases, chronic disease, meaning these long-term diseases that are largely rooted in diet and lifestyle, often preventable, is that the majority of these diseases that are affecting Americans are very much interrelated. They're very connected and they're connected by metabolic dysfunction. Unfortunately, the way we conventionally view diseases, different diseases in our, in our system is we think of them as isolated silos, that these ones you mentioned, that Alzheimer's dementia is different than diabetes, is different than obesity, is different than depression, is different than infertility, you know, is different than cancer is different than gout. We, we think, you know, a doctor would look at those and say, oh yeah, this goes to one specialty, this goes to the other, and we'll have a different medication for, for every single one. But the, the interesting thing and the beautiful opportunity actually is that what we're learning now is that these diseases are all in the same network. And the, the link that's connecting them is metabolic dysfunction. And metabolic dysfunction um, one of the ways that you can see that and one of the manifestations of that is erratic dysfunctional blood sugar control. So what is metabolic health? So metabolic health is talking about the way we produce energy in the body. And we have somewhere around, it's of course impossible to know exactly, but somewhere around 37 trillion cells in the human body a lot of cells <laughs> and every single one of them is this like incredible little factory with just a whole universe going on inside of them. And for every single function to happen within that cell, essentially it needs energy to power these little machines. And that energy comes from our metabolism. So metabolic health is when you can produce energy properly in the body. And that is so fundamental to all aspects of health, to to so many symptoms and diseases that we're having today. Because if you think about it, if a certain cell type isn't getting energy properly, that group of cells is not going to work well. And therefore you're going to have, so cellular dysfunction leads to tissue dysfunction, tissue dysfunction leads to organ dysfunction, organ dysfunction leads to symptoms and disease. And wherever that energy problem is happening in the body, it can look like anything, which is why metabolic dysfunction can be this masquerader of all these different symptoms because it's dealing with a core fundamental pathway related to all cells. And so that's, I think, a really key point for people to understand is that this isn't like some downstream disease situation. This is a core fundamental pathway for everything to work. And based on different people, if these processes are problematic, it can look like many many different things. It's a, if it's happening in the blood vessels of the penis, it looks like erectile dysfunction. If it's happening in the blood vessels of the retina, it looks like preventable blindness. If it's happening in, you know, the heart, it could look like a heart attack in the brain, Alzheimer's, dementia, depression, chronic pain. It, it really can look like so many things. So what we need to focus on is how do we produce energy properly in the body and why do we have an epidemic right now, not of all these isolated diseases, but with a problem in how the American body is making, processing, and storing energy? And that's the fundamental question. That is the elephant in the room of modern, modern American healthcare that we have to solve if we're going to make any progress in reducing our $4 trillion healthcare costs, if we're going to make any progress in improving the thriving um, happiness and productivity of Americans, if we're going to deal with the obesity epidemic, and if we're going to reduce the chronic disease epidemic, and of course, if we're going to truly get on top of 
COVID and any future pandemic that we deal with, since of course we've learned over the past two years that this problem with energy production in the body, metabolic dysfunction is a key driver of morbidity and mortality in COVID. So it is really um, critical. And getting to your glucose question. So one of the ways that the body makes energy is it takes in these substrates like glucose or fat. Those are the two main ones, converts them within the cell to a chemical currency of energy called ATP. And so that conversion process of these substrates through the mitochondria and in, in the cell to a currency that we can use, you know, coins that can go into the, into the machine, um, that process, um, of course, involves glucose, can also involve fat. And what's happening right now is our standard American diet and other very modern, very recent monumental changes in the exposures that our bodies have. So standard American diet, which I would summarize as chronic processed overnutrition, too much energetic substrate, coupled with a lot of the other things like sedentary behavior, poor sleep, chronic low-grade stress. What these things translate to in the body is hijacking that cellular mitochondrial process of converting glucose and fat to ATP. We are literally gumming up that system and things cannot flow through. And something I find really fascinating about the energy conversation is that we actually now have access to too much energy substrate, the, the, the part that starts that process towards ATP. There's too much. So you could say, oh, well, we have too much energy, so why can't we just make more energy? But one thing, one way I think about it in my mind is that if you had like a factory that was making something like I don't know, cheese, who knows? And you all of a sudden got delivered five times as much of the raw ingredients, like milk or whatever. It's like all being delivered on the same day. Well, you know, the factory can't take that all in. They can't store it. They can't process it. It's going to go bad. The factory workers are going to be like, this is way too much. We don't know what to do. We can't do our jobs. And you end up making much less of the actual product because it's chaos. It's, it's overwhelm. It's mayhem. And that's exactly what's going on inside our bodies. We are just loading it with glucose, saturated fat, omega-6 oils, all this stuff. And these poor cells do not know what to do. And this is such a recent phenomenon. We're talking like 50 to 100 years that we've been, this, this beautiful machine of the body is exposed to these, these external stressors that it cannot handle. And what we're seeing in our healthcare today is the body saying, I can't, no more, and it's breaking down. And so our role as individuals is to understand that and to make different choices to alleviate that strain and that stress on the body that's leading to monumental fundamental dysfunction. And the beautiful thing is it's really not that hard, uh, but you have to understand some of these principles and you have to know where you're at and you have to know what's negatively affecting you. And it would be so easy for someone to say, oh my God, we've, we've been around for behavioral modern humans have been around for you know 40,000 years. Humans in general have been around like a lot longer why do we need to like track or monitor or understand this now? We've kind of been doing fine. But the issue is that we are facing an uphill battle like never before. The cards are so monumentally stacked against us right now with just what is normalized in terms of culture and is so new. Um, the food, the stress, the digital world, the sleep deprivation, the sedentary behavior. And so in the face of brand new challenges, and unfortunately, coupled with a healthcare system that, in, that does not look at disease in this root cause way, that really is looking at success criteria as managing symptoms, but not creating health in the face of that. And third, in the face of a, unfortunately, a government, which does lots of things right, but one thing it does fundamentally wrong is subsidize the production of the most disease promoting foods in an effort to support American agriculture, which is a noble effort, but unfortunately is the wrong decision for health. So we have cheap food, we have doctors who are not treating root causes, and we have monumental challenges that our bodies are facing. And therefore it is up to us as individuals to get on top of this. And we can, it's not that hard and it can radically change your health. If you get on top of metabolism, how to produce energy properly in your body, 
and of course, therefore, how to get your glucose levels um, under better control. Mm. Casey, crushing it. You speak so powerfully and eloquently about so many different issues there um, and really, uh, in some ways, make human mechanism, which can be overwhelming for people who didn't go to med school, you make it so um, palatable and understandable. So thank you so much. Because, you know, when people think about metabolism, that word often gets thrown around, oh, well, that person has a good metabolism, or I have a bad metabolism. And what does that actually mean? Well, I think you just did a great summary there as what is our ability to produce energy efficiently within the body. So let's just talk about that process for a little bit a, a little bit longer. You can think about it as cellular respiration or, or however you want to think about it, but essentially we eat food, it gets broken down by enzymes and acids in our stomach, it moves into our small intestine and gets absorbed. Um, this is very general right now. Not everything gets absorbed. <laughs> but um, but uh, let's say carbohydrates in this particular case get absorbed. The pancreas uh, secretes insulin, which is a peptide um, that picks up um, uh, glucose uh, in the bloodstream and ushers it um, in the best case scenario into the cell, as you described, for uh, energy production in our mitochondria for the production of adenosine triphosphate. So great, when that's all working um, well, we're, are, we are working well, but as you say, we have a sort of a supply chain problem, but the opposite one that we're having at our, <laughs> at our ports, we have too many ships actually now coming into the harbor through overnutrition. And for a variety of different reasons, we, what we can talk about, which is insulin resistance, um, or our pancreas not producing enough insulin, but we're ending up with too much glucose in our bloodstream or hyperglycemia. And um, so maybe pull that thread a little bit. What happens when we have excess glucose in our bloodstream? And what are some of the downstream or knock-on impacts of that? So I think two important things here one being sort of the initial question, which is like digging a little bit deeper into why, why this happens. Why does the glucose rise and the insulin story a little bit? And then two, what is the biologic result of glucose being, being high? So in terms of that first question, you alluded to this a bit, which is that for glucose to be taken, glucose is blood sugar, of course, and, and for that to be taken out of the bloodstream into the cells to be processed or stored, it requires in most cell types, insulin, which is like a lock and key that when, when glucose comes into the bloodstream and, and rises, the pancreas releases this hormone insulin, which then binds to the cell receptor and allows for the glucose to, to come in. The glucose then is going to be transported to the mitochondria. And this is the key thing. Anything that damages the function of the mitochondria is going to essentially create a backup of glucose in the cell that's ultimately going to also signal for this process called insulin resistance to happen. And insulin resistance is a sort of protective mechanism of the cell saying, we're not able to process all this glucose, so stop putting it in the cell. So the cell becomes less sensitive to that insulin signal, and therefore what's going to happen is less glucose is going to get into the cell. You're going to start seeing that rise in the bloodstream. And this block to insulin, you know, it's sort of like the, the cell saying, like, there's no room at the end, and so, like, we're going to help protect the cell from more coming in because we can't, we can't host it. So then you've got to think about, well, what are the things that are going to potentially make the mitochondria not able to process that glucose? Um, and one of the, it's, it's interesting, like one is just what we were talking about before, which is having just over um, being asked to produce, to process too much glucose, but there's other things and really anything that creates oxidative stress. So too much free radical activity in the cell can also really hurt the mitochondria. So this is a way that insulin resistance and problems with glucose can arise actually separate 
from just over too much glucose in the body and that are really important to zero in on. And I think a framework to think about is like anything that's hurting my mitochondria is making me less metabolically healthy. Cause then you open it up from, it's just sugar that's causing diabetes and obesity to actually there's a whole world of things that can impact the mitochondria and lead to these problems. So for instance, like, um, interestingly, fructose, which is not glucose, but it's, you know, what's found in high fructose corn syrup and what's found in, um, juice and, and, you know, in high levels in these foods that are refined, um, fructose products. So interestingly as fructose, even though it will not raise glucose in the bloodstream, it will be processed by the cell in such a way that it generates a metabolic byproduct called uric acid. And uric acid is a molecule that actually creates oxidative stress in the mitochondria. So even though this is glucose independent, it's creating a problem in the mitochondria, which is then telling the cell, we can't process all this glucose, become insulin resistant. So oxidative stress can happen. And uric acid is one example, of course, oxidized, other oxidized foods. So we hear a lot about oxidized seed oils. So these like vegetable oils and seed oils um, that are prone to oxidation, those can also hurt the mitochondria. And stress can, can do this as well. It can generate damage in the mitochondria. So that's just to say there's sort of a holistic world of things that can impact the mitochondria that can lead to problems with how the cell is processing glucose and cause glucose to rise in the body. And then you hear about all these, um, you know, sort of things that people are doing now to kind of improve their health, the sort of biohackery type things like cold plunging and saunas and intermittent fasting. And I think it's interesting to just touch on this really quickly, because in many ways, these are helping by impacting the mitochondria. When we're fasting, when we are putting um, the body into cold stress, um, when we do, you know, high intensity interval training or zone two training, actually lower intensity, longer periods of training, what we are doing is building, we are stimulating the body to build more mitochondria. And the reason this feeds into helping with glucose production is for this, it's the other side of this coin. The more you can flow glucose through this system and have these well-functioning machines to process the glucose, of course, the better the cell is going to be at being able to take more in and it's not going to need to have that insulin resistance signal. So, um, so this is just a little bit of a lay of the land of mitochondria and, and insulin resistance. Ultimately, you want our cells to be very sensitive, sensitive to insulin and to really take in what it needs, process it, be done and not have all this excess. So let's say we become, we're becoming insulin resistant and what's happening is that blood sugar is, you know, essentially starting to rise in the body. Well, one interesting thing to realize is that the, the, the blood sugar is actually not going to rise immediately. Once you start becoming insulin resistant, the body is very smart and it actually overcompensates by producing more insulin to help drive that glucose into the cell. And so that's this period of time where your glucose might actually look normal in your bloodstream and on your measurements, but the body's actually in this overcompensation period where it's churning out way more insulin to try and essentially compensate for that insulin resistance and drive more glucose into the cell. And this is a really interesting phase of, of health that actually lasts potentially like decades where you are getting more metabolically dysfunctional, but you're not necessarily seeing it on your standard lab tests of like a fasting glucose that your doctor might order. And the issue is that we don't actually test fasting insulin in our standard clinical practice. Most functional medicine doctors do, um, and sort of more forward thinking metabolic health doctors will test fasting insulin. But if you don't have a picture into that, you could actually be going quite down this spectrum without knowing it in this overcompensation period. So that's just one practical recommendation is to really know where you stand on this, on this spectrum, get a fasting insulin test along with your fasting glucose. So you know, basically how hard the body is working to keep your glucose levels at whatever they are. And to make this concrete, let's say you and I both had a fasting blood sugar level of 80 milligrams per deciliter, which is in the normal range, not close to prediabetes, totally fine. If my body is quite insulin resistant, um, I might be having to put out 30, you know, of insulin to keep my glucose at 80. And you might have an, a fasting insulin level of two. So I'm at 30, you're at two. 
I'm probably going to get diabetes. You're not. And yet on standard lab tests, we look the same. So that's a really important reason to ask your doctor for a fasting, um, a fasting insulin test. Over time, that compensation mechanism will break down if you continue doing all the normal American lifestyle things and you can't compensate anymore and then fast and then glucose will just start going up. And that's when you go to the doctor and they say, oh, your, your blood sugar is creeping up. Oh, you're going into prediabetes range. And the pretty crazy thing is that right now, almost 50% of American adults are in that clinical category, prediabetes or type two diabetes. So 130 million Americans are in this state. And if you, if you know, if you add in what I just said about all those people who may be in that compensatory part of the spectrum, there's probably, I don't know, but I'd guess a hundred million more who are in that, on that spectrum towards disease, but haven't quite hit it yet in terms of their glucose levels rising. So, you know, that's an, that's a population I really I mean, I really want to focus on in terms of trying to shift our mindset in healthcare, because right now we don't pay attention to anyone until really they've reached the type two diabetes threshold, which, as you can tell from this conversation, is probably decades after all of this started. And so there is just so much opportunity. And it is also much easier to turn around this ship and go in the right direction on that spectrum earlier. And that's in part because long-term damage to our mitochondria makes them less functional. Like you can regenerate mitochondria, you can improve mitochondrial function, but if you've been dealing with these issues for 20, 30 years, it's harder to turn that ship and turn them all on again. If you, if you're getting on top of this really early, you still got really good functionality. And so early is better. So that's why we really, because the healthcare system is not going to pick up on this for us. We really have to be asking for the right labs, thinking through this framework and making sure we know what's going on. And then just to to quickly get onto the the second part of the question, which was (laughs) what's the problem with the glucose levels rising? I mean, one, it's it's an indicator of cellular dysfunction, like like we've been talking about, but the glucose rising in its own right is is actually very bad for the body. So there's, there's three main things that happen when our glucose levels are quite high. The first is that that glucose the extra glucose floating around in our bloodstream, it's going to go and stick to things. And that's a process called glycation. And so it's floating around your blood vessels. It's floating around your capillaries. It's floating all around and it's going to stick to blood vessel walls. It's going to stick to cell membranes, proteins. If it's inside the cell, too much of it, it's going to stick to DNA and it causes dysfunction. Glycation is not good. It's sometimes considered in terms of the chemical reaction that's happening when glucose sticks to things, it's like rusting of the body and that's not good. So that's a term people might hear is the creation of advanced glycation end products, ages. That's essentially glucose sticking to things and making whatever it sticks to less functional. So when I'm thinking about keeping my glucose down through diet, through lifestyle, through all the things, I'm like, yeah, I want a lower concentration in my bloodstream so that's not sticking to everything. And one, one fun factoid wrinkles are actually a product of glycation and collagen, which is one of the most abundant proteins in the entire body. I think it might actually be the most abundant protein in the body. Collagen, when it gets sugar stuck to it, cross links and creates these links that actually create wrinkling of the skin. So, and there's been studies in vitro showing that reduction of glucose concentration around collagen can greatly diminish the cross-linking pattern that happens. And this also happens with other structural proteins in the skin. So another reason I care about keeping my glucose down, and it's very true that, you know, even these cosmetic things and beauty, like it's from the inside out for sure. Um, There is no cream that can ameliorate the cross-linking of collagen via glycation. So that's one. Number two is that high glucose in the bloodstream can generate inflammation. It's, it's, a, it's an abnormal thing that's happening in the body and anything abnormal in the body is going to trigger the immune system to think there's a threat or something weird going on and it needs to activate. And we do not want chronic inflammation. We do not want those immune cells constantly secreting their little warlike cytokines, getting the body all activated in defense mode. We want to be in repair and recovery and growth mode, not in threat all hands on deck mode. So sugar will do that. Um, And the third thing is that the high glucose generates additional oxidative stress. So it's sort of unfortunately like a vicious cycle. So glycation, inflammation, oxidative stress, um, 
And that's sort of molecularly, but there's also a very subjective issue with um, glucose being high, which is that when you, let's say, eat, let's say you eat a huge bowl of Cheerios, tons of carbohydrates, minimal fat, protein, and fiber in there, that's going to be a big glucose load into the bloodstream. When you go up really high, you've got all those other issues we just talked about, but you're also going to cause your body to just do a huge surge of insulin because the body's like, oh my God, there's so much glucose around. We need a huge, huge surge of insulin. And the body can sometimes overcompensate in that moment, that post-meal moment, and cause you to crash and actually dip below your pre-meal levels. And so if for people who are watching the video, it'll be like straight up and then down below baseline and back to normal. And that crash, which is called postprandial, post-meal, hypoglycemia, low glucose, is associated with a lot of subjective issues like fatigue, brain fog, reduced fact recall, mood lability. So I really think about in terms of stabilizing glucose and working in my day-to-day life to do that of like glucose fluctuations day-to-day mirror subjective fluctuations in my experience of the day. And I want, obviously we all, I think, want more stability in our day, whether it's energy, mood, um, cravings, That's another big one. In that reactive hypoglycemia period, people can often have cravings for the next meal. It triggers some of our um, hunger hormones. So stability is good, not only for the molecular reasons, but just for the subjective feeling of our day. So the chronic disease epidemic stems from a breakdown in the body's ability to turn food into energy and to get rid of waste. And this is otherwise known as metabolic dysfunction. When metabolic dysfunction occurs, it disrupts the normal processes of cellular metabolism, including the processes within the mitochondria. And since the mitochondria are responsible for generating all of our energy, this has significant impacts on our health and how we feel. So we want to nurture these little organelles, our mitochondria, by avoiding the consumption of too much glucose and too much fructose that lead to insulin resistance and oxidative stress. So we can minimize these conditions by eating an antioxidant-rich diet, limiting our consumption of processed foods, decreasing our exposure to environmental toxins, managing stress levels, and getting the right amount of exercise and sleep. I often stress that when we understand mechanism, when we recognize the interconnectedness of various conditions and what contributes to metabolic health, we're more likely to adopt healthier habits and the protocols and take agency over our well being. The influence we can have on our health is significant. And as you'll hear in this upcoming segment from the brilliant Dr. Robert Lustig, we can also make a significant impact on the generations to come. So Dr. Lustig is a neuroendocrinologist, author, and professor. He illuminates for us why a real whole foods diet is essential for addressing metabolic health. So here you have Dr. Robert Lustig. Insulin is the diabetes hormone, right? Diabetics take insulin. Okay, they do it to lower their blood glucose. True. Okay, where did the blood glucose go? So you have a diabetic, his blood sugar is 300. You give him a shot of insulin, blood sugar goes from 300 to 100. Where did the 200 points of blood sugar go? Answer, to the fat for storage. So insulin is really not the diabetes hormone. Insulin is the energy storage hormone. Whatever you're not burning, you have to store, and insulin is the way you store it. If there's no insulin, then basically your fat cells give up everything in them. And that's what causes this phenomenon called diabetic ketoacidosis, which is, you know, a complication of type one diabetes, something I took care of for many, many decades. All right. So insulin is the energy storage hormone. That's the way you need to think about it. Now, in order to do its job, 
insulin has two pathways in the cell. One we will call the metabolic pathway, and the other one we will call the cell growth pathway. Now, the metabolic pathway is mediated through a specific chemical in the, in the uh, cell called AKT, a specific transcription factor called AKT, and it will lower blood glucose and it will tell the liver, don't put out extra glucose into the bloodstream. And it will, you know, basically do the storage portion. And so the metabolic side of insulin, for lack of a better word, is good. That's what you need insulin for. But insulin also has a second pathway. It's the cell growth pathway, and it's mediated through a different transcription factor called MAP kinase ERK. And those, that, that pathway causes cell proliferation. It's the reason why your coronary arteries proliferate and then get narrow because of cell proliferation. It's the reason why your breast tissue or your prostate tissue expands and increases in number and then turns cancerous because of the you know in uh, unregulated cell division in other words insulin drives inappropriate cell proliferation and growth and in doing so it causes problems in your arteries problems in your glands problems in your brain problems in your heart problems all over your body which ultimately lead to chronic metabolic disease so high levels of insulin are bad for you so while insulin is necessary too much insulin is a disaster so you don't want zero and you don't want a lot. You want the sweet spot in the middle. The problem is we ain't there. <laughs> We're not okay. anywhere yeah. near that sweet spot. We have insulin levels that are so much higher than what they should be. A good fasting insulin level would be anywhere from two to seven, okay? Our fast, you know, uh, fasting insulin uh, you know, median is about 12, and if you're above 15, you're going to die. Yeah. You're going to die from insulin resistance. You're going to die from these chronic metabolic diseases. So why is everybody's insulin level so high? Because of the fat in the liver. And what made the fat? And because then the pancreas has to make more insulin to make the liver do its job. So that's the reason why the insulin levels are high. That's why we have insulin resistance is the fat in the liver. Well, what caused the fat in the liver? sugar. Yeah. That's how we got the fat in the liver. And so it all comes back to this, you know, sugar glut that the food industry perpetrated upon us because they learned that sugar was addictive. When they added it, we bought more. Yeah. So essentially when insulin cannot usher glucose um, into the cell for energy production in the mitochondria, it can do a couple of things with it. Um, one of which is to essentially contribute to fat in the liver, yep. which then uh, downstream creates insulin resistance, which then tells the pancreas to make more insulin to deal with all of the influx of sugar that we're eating. And, um, and it's funny because, you know, I wear a, a continuous glucose monitor mm -hmm. and, um, and it's been, um, it, 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 you know, very eye opening in terms of just, you know, what spikes me and what doesn't, and, and that's been helpful. But I think mm -hmm. as a diagnostic test, as you point out, fasting insulin levels would be a much better, uh, indicator of metabolic health than the That's downstream right. of, uh, of uh, glucose, right? That's right. Glucose is the last thing to change. So while I'm for it because it's here, mm -hmm. it's going to end up being a, you know, m m a, 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 an adjunct, a, a minor player, but it's here now so and we can use it. So I'm for it, but there are other metabolic indicators that can be also gleaned uh, from a continuous monitor, from a wearable, such as lactate, 
such as ketones, such as alcohol. And the most important one is insulin, to actually measure insulin. Now, insulin is a protein, I mean, a peptide. It's in much lower concentration, right? So it's going to require a little bit extra work, but people are working on it. And yeah. so I'm hoping, I think, you know, within five years, we will have a continuous insulin monitor and that will be a huge uh, advantage. Huge. So I want to respect um, the limits of your, your time, um, but I, I want to just ask you in closing, kind of how do we get from here to there? I mean, obviously you and many others are educating people around sugar around the food industry, but really what we are going to need is a tectonic cultural change is what you call it kind of towards the end of your book. Yeah. And you, and you point to other cultural changes and public health measures that have been adopted on a mass level. Maybe you could address those quickly right. and right. how you think of food playing into a, a similar tectonic shift. Right. So in the last 30 years, America has experienced four, count them, four cultural tectonic shifts. And here they are. Number one, bicycle helmets and seatbelts. Two, smoking in public places. Three, drunk driving. Four, condoms in bathrooms. Now, 30 years ago, if any legislator stood up in a state house or Congress or parliament or anywhere else in the world and proposed legislation for any one of those four, they had gotten laughed right out of town. Nanny state, liberty interest, get out of my kitchen, get out of my bathroom, get out of my car. Right? Today, they're all facts of life. Nobody's belly aching about any of those. Oh, they're belly aching about other stuff like vac vaccine mandates. I mean, we got new stuff, but no one's belly aching about those four, right? Those are settled. And if you pull out of your driveway and you haven't clicked your seatbelt, your kids will scream at you. That's right. Now, how'd that happen? What happened? Answer, we taught the children. The children grew up and they voted, and the naysayers are dead. That's why this is a cultural tectonic shift. And it's also why it's a generational shift. That's why it takes 30 years, is because it's new people. Mm -hmm. People don't actually change their belief system. They don't listen to me on your show and change their belief system. I wish they did, but they don't. And all you have to do is see what's going on with the January 6th committee to see how people do not change their belief system, even when presented with information. All right. The belief system is the belief system. But what you can do is you can teach the next generation. And ultimately, that's how you effectuate change. Well, we're about nine years uh, into a 30 year cycle on food. Hmm. Okay. We started this about nine years ago when we realized that sugar was a toxin and started getting that word out. And kids now know this and they're actually demanding better. And we're supplying it. We're actually getting food, you know, real food into schools in part because the kids want it. My nonprofit called Eat Real, working with 315 school districts in three states right now, we want to be national. Okay, to get real food into schools and parents want it too. Well, why do they want it? The answer is because now they know, because they've yeah. learned. So the bottom line is, yes, you can effectuate major changes, but you have to do the education, you have to plow the ground, you have to plant the seeds and you have to water it. You know, that's a consistent, constant process. And ultimately, Yes, it will take root, it will take hold, and it will flourish. Yeah. And, you know, one thing I, I really just have to point out is that you've done a great job um, kind of demystifying uh, the coastal components or the notion that somehow real food is a feat or only for the affluent or only affordable at right. 
Erewhon or, or Whole Foods. Well, and uh, yeah, it, 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 well, unfortunately, real food does cost more. Yeah, but yeah. the question is why, and the answer is very simple: right. one word, subsidies. 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 Yeah. Okay, if, if if there were no subsidies, real food wouldn't cost more. Right? When you when you have a subsidy, basically you're subsidizing whatever it is you're subsidizing, but that means you're taxing everything else in order to make book. So right. it distorts the market. So the subsidies for corn, wheat, soy, sugar are killing us, and they distort the market to make it impossible to buy real food. So my goal is to get rid of all food subsidies. Mm -hmm. The question is, would the price of food change? And the answer is actually, no, it wouldn't. The only two items that would go up, corn and sugar. And those are the things we want to go up. Right. And as you say, we can pay the farmer or pay, or the, pay the pharma the doctor. <laughs> yeah. and the doctor. Right. Or the doctor or the, yeah. right. So, so the bottom line is this is not rocket science. This is simple economics, okay? The difference is that the standard thought process is that you've got food in this one silo and you've got medicine in this other silo and the two have nothing to do with each other. Wrong. Now, if you by accident put the food and the medicine in the same silo, you would see that basically it's all draining away. The amount of money that we spend on cleaning up the food industry's mess is so enormous, it's unsustainable. When people yeah. recognize that the food and the medicine actually are the same thing rather than different things, they'll come around. And that's yeah. my job. Well, big food maintains its profitability because it externalizes all of its costs. It's exactly. Period. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. And I think you and I both dream of the day where someone could go to their primary care physician and that doctor could prescribe real food and the insurance company would cover it. That it's would happening. be the day. It's already happening. It's already Is happening. Um, I, I'm a chief medical officer of a procurement startup called Fugal, F-O-O-G-A-L. Hmm. And this is exactly what we do. We uh, link together four stakeholders, the patient, the doctor, the grocery store, and the insurance company. Amazing. And you got to pull that thread out a little bit because at the end of the day, that's going to be worth it, not just for the patient, obviously, but also for the retailer who, as you point out, does not have a very big margin. Their That's margins right. are squeezed on processed right. foods. Exactly. And right. long term, yeah, the insurance companies might not be able to raise your rates for pre-existing conditions, but they're also not going to have to cover your heart bypass surgery. Exactly. So, right. They will save so much, they will make money. Yeah. Everyone wins, except so for this <laughs> yeah, right. But, you know, there's nothing wrong with a, you know, a, a $500 billion uh, pharma industry instead of a $2 trillion pharma industry, right? Exactly. So, well, they think well, so. Yeah, they think so. <laughs> well, so we, have I, uh, we have a lot of work to do, but thank, thank you so much for the work that you're doing and, you know, leading from the front here as you have uh, for quite a long time. And uh, hey, I'm... The science, the science is there and the science has to drive the policy. The problem is the politics get in the way. Insulin serves as more than just the diabetes hormone. It also manages energy storage. Its role includes reducing blood glucose levels and then storing excess glucose as fat, either in the liver or in fat cells, adipocytes. Now within cells, insulin operates through two pathways. The metabolic pathway, which lowers blood glucose and facilitates storage, and the cell growth pathway, which promotes cell proliferation. Excessive levels of insulin in the metabolic pathway contribute to insulin resistance and chronic metabolic diseases, 
whereas excessive insulin in the cell growth pathway can sometimes lead to the growth of cancer cells. Now, interestingly, high insulin levels are often a consequence of liver fat accumulation caused by excessive sugar consumption. So an essential aspect of improving insulin levels involves prioritizing real, unprocessed, nutrient-dense food. Now, even though the scientific evidence linking food and health is clear, government subsidizes corn, wheat, soy, and sugar. And this distorts the marketplace and makes healthier food options much less affordable. So what we need is a cultural shift so that eating real nutrient dense unprocessed food becomes as important and second nature as buckling your seatbelt when you get in the car. Now, I know that was a lot to digest. So here are a few key points that you can take away from today's episode. Number one, if you have chronic fatigue, brain fog, or excess belly fat, get your blood sugar tested, or even better, take control of your own health and get a continuous glucose monitor. If you ask your doctor, they just might prescribe it for you. Number two, insulin levels are the most important indicator of health and longevity. So go get your fasting insulin tested. Number three, limit sugar and processed food and eat more fiber. Number four, take the time to rest and repair. Good sleep and stress management is central to maintaining insulin sensitivity and lowering blood glucose levels. And number five, support local farms and farm stands. Vote with your fork and talk to your representatives about stopping the subsidies that allow big food to poison us literally with food stuff that is made below the true cost of production. So I hope this episode has shed light on diet, blood sugar, and metabolic health. Eight of the top 10 killers can be directly linked to metabolic dysfunction. So there's every reason to care about it. The good news is that metabolic dysfunction is both preventable and generally reversible by adopting the right lifestyle protocols. Take it from me, you have agency. Now, if you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and hit the notification bell so you never miss another show. Leave a comment to let us know your thoughts and don't forget to share our content with others who might benefit from this valuable information. Okay, that's all from the commune for today. My name is Jeff Krasnow and I am here for you.